uh, welcome to the third Survivor Patari session. Uh, this this is going to be the last of this series of uh, survival pratari's. Uh, in this presentation, uh, we'll briefly talk about. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly present the recap of what we uh, have been talking in the previous two sessions. Uh, we'll be this session is going to be more focused towards survival analysis in computational pathology. What the challenges are, then uh, Rob and Noor will be. Uh, talking about the existing solutions in the literature. And at the end, uh, Fayaz will be taking over and he will speak about the performance assessment issues in survival analysis in computational pathology and overall as well. So he'll tell you ways, well, how not to do it. And then we'll have a small question and answer sessions if you have any questions and comments. OK, so survival analysis, a uh, quick overview. Well, as the name suggests, it is a study of survival times and the factors that influence the survival of an individual. Uh, we are mostly interested in four kinds of analyses here. We want to estimate the survival probability of an individual over time. Uh, we might be interested in how the hazard uh, behaves along time. Um, then we want to we sometimes we want to compare how two groups uh, how the survival of two groups compares uh, in terms of survival and we may also want to model the effect of certain factors that we think affect the survival of an individual so the statistical approach to perform survival analysis is that we have a data set in which for each data point we have some features. Uh, the, those can be age or some other feature that, that uh, we think uh, is can, can affect the survivals. Then we have whether the individual has experienced an event or not. So the zero here means that the that the individual or the example hasn't uh, experienced the event of interest yet. So the event might be in case of patient studies, it might be the event of interest might be death. In case of uh, electronic equipment, it might be uh, failure of the equipment and anything that we are interested in analyzing. The time here represents that how long has the individual been observed? So here 13 and 1 mean that the individual was observed for 13 time units and the event happened after 13 time units. We pass this on to a modeling method uh, if we are interested in performing non-parametric approach uh, in non-parametric model modeling we uh, go for something like kaplan meier estimation if we are interested in some sort of semi-parametric modeling the most commonly used method is the cox proportional hazards model and there are some parametric methods out there as well and what we ultimately get is a model of the survival function using which we can estimate the survival probabilities of individuals in the future. Now, once we have these survival models, we want to evaluate how good are they? How, how good can we expect these models to perform? So we evaluate them uh, on, uh, according to two uh, perspectives. So the first one is the first thing that we might be interested in is how does a particular feature or a particular covariate affect the survival of an individual? And the second thing that we are typically interested in is that how accurate is the model that we have proposed for survival? So for modeling the uh, effect of covariates, one of the most commonly methods that you'll come across is the use of p-values in the log rank test of comparing uh, two distributions of uh, survival groups. So for example, here on the, in the figure, you can see that we have two groups, uh, one uh, two groups of patients. One of them were administered chemo before surgery and the other one and other ones were administered chemo after su surgery. 
And what this tells us that after we performed the log rank test here, we had a p-value of 0 0.0085. So p-value tells us how probable is it to observe the difference that we can see here by chance. So it's a measure of significance. It tells us that there is uh, the difference that you are observing in these two groups here. There is only a 0.85% chance that it might have occurred by chance and we typically like them small. However, the problem with these p-values is that we don't get any quantification of the effect of a covariate. We know that it is having a statistically significant effect, but we cannot quantify how much effect there is. For that purpose, uh, what we typically use are these measures called hazard ratios. So to put simply, these are simply the relative risk of two groups. For example, if we want to measure an effect of a drug, we might uh, get, we might calculate the ratio of the hazard of the group that was given the drug versus uh, the group that wasn't given the drug. And if we have in this case a hazard ratio of greater than one, it means that the drug has a negative impact on survival. The drug increases hazard and therefore uh, has a negative impact on the survival. If on the other hand, we get a hazard ratio of less than one, it means that the drug is having a decreasing impact on the survival, oh, sorry, on the hazard and therefore a positive impact on survival. Values close to one mean would mean that there is no significant effect of giving the drug to a group of patients. OK, the next uh, group of measures is we, we want to see how good our model is at modeling survival. So one of the very commonly used measures is the concordance index. To put simply, it measures, it compares the ranking of your score with the ranking of the original times of uh, the data points. If the ranking is, is the same as uh, it, uh, if the ranking of your scores is the same as the original times <clears throat> then you'll have a, a perfect concordance index and that would be equal to one. Uh, another measure, now the problem with concordance index is that it just measures the ranking performance. It won't measure the uh, accuracy of the exact scores produced by your model. Now, if you, if you have a calibrated model that you know can provide you with survival probabilities, then you might want to use something known as a Briar score, which actually is the squared uh, distance between the observed survivals and uh, the predicted survival probabilities. So this was a brief uh, overview of the evaluation metrics. There are many others, but these are the ones that you will see most being most commonly used in the literature. Uh, just a word of caution, both these concordance indices and Briar scores, they have been found to be overly optimistic when you have large amounts of censoring in your data. So be careful about that. Now, the next part, uh, as discussed in the last Patari session, was machine learning for survival analysis. So naturally, the first question would be, why do we want uh, machine learning for survival analysis? We have the good old Cox proportional hazards model. Well, yes, it might Cox proportional hazards model may work just fine, uh, but it has some assumptions. The first and foremost being that the hazards for any two individuals remains constant. That is the proportional hazards assumption. And another uh, shortcoming that these models have is that these are linear. They model the they can model only linear effect of the uh, features. So if we are interested in modeling nonlinear effect and so we, we we might want to use machine learning for that. So what we typically want, just like any other machine learning model, we are given some data points, we are given some relevant information and what we do is we develop a model. So here in survival analysis, similarly, we have some data points. 
we may have some features corresponding to each data point, which in computational pathology, we typically have whole slide images corresponding to each data point. We may have we will have we are expected to have corresponding survival times for each of the individuals which tell us how much time an individual is known to have survived and then we have whether an individual had uh, experienced the event of interest or not which might be death or disease relapse in in uh, me medical medicine related studies and what we want to do is we want to learn a model that can model survival or that or that can, that produces a risk score that is representative of the expected prognosis of uh, patients. So in computational pathology, we typically want to estimate the survivals using whole slide images. Now there are two most commonly followed approaches. One of them is that a score is developed using some other technique and then the score is evaluated for its prognostic significance using Cox proportional hazards model or any other uh, parametric or non-parametric approach. The other one is to develop a survival model in an end-to-end -end fashion. You develop a model using a tree, you train a model to be to produce survival uh, times. Now there are certain challenges when it comes to survival analysis and survival analysis in computational pathology uh, to be more precise. First thing is estimating survival from whole site images is hard because we are used to of patch level modeling given the huge sizes sizes of whole slide images and we do not have patch level annotations for survival. We cannot, we are not sure about which patches represent, will represent a good or bad prognosis. So it means that we do not have accurate patch level labels and it means that conventional supervised learning patch level models will not be appropriate in this case. So some sort of an aggregation scheme or let's say weekly supervised methods are to be used if we want whole slide images to be used for uh, survival analysis. Now, Another point is that survival is a property associated with a patient. It is not a property associated with whole slide images alone. There are many factors that can affect survival in a patient. It might be underlying health conditions, age, genetic makeup, what, what sort of therapies had been given and are being given. Whole slide image is a teeny tiny part of this whole huge complex picture. What we have is just this one tiny dot using which we want to uh, we want to model and we want to predict the survival. I must mention here that I'm not saying that it's not possible. It's there may be some survival signal in a whole slide image and due to its multiplicative effect it might be able to improve uh, the, the, pro the prognostic uh, predictions by a lot. However, expecting it to model survival, model survival accurately is a bit too ambitious because there are several other factors inside and outside a human body that might affect the survival of even a cancer patient. Of course, and that leads us, us to the next challenge. OK, if we if whole slide, if we need more information other than the whole slide images, then we may want to add data from other modalities as well. We might want to add radiology data. We might want to add data from other blood tests and gene expression data. Now that comes with a whole lot of other challenges that are related to collection of such data curation of such data and then developing models that can integrate all these in a single model. So 
what makes a model decide that person A is going to live longer than person B? Especially when we use deep learning approaches, it has the well-known black box problems. So, and the problem with these models is that their high capacity and their opaqueness, it makes these models quite prone to spurious correlations to be learned as discriminatory features. And we, since our work here in computational pathology is going to, is expected to have implications on, on patients' well being, we need to be sure that the decisions being taken by these models, they do make sense. And therefore, we want methods to either determine what these black box. Uh, beasts are learning, or we need interpretable models. Then there are several data related challenges that are just not restricted to survival analysis only. They are overall in computational pathologies, uh, computational pathology. We already know that the data is scanned. OK, yes, we do have a petascale data. We, we do have petascale data. But the number of individual examples in a given data set is relatively small as compared to the numbers they have in, in other computer, computer vision uh, problems. And in survival analysis, what worsens the situation is something known as censoring. The data points that we have to skip because the event wasn't observed during the period of the study and we cannot use that data uh, to for for effective modeling. Add that to the already high dimensionality of the data and there you have a perfect recipe for overfitting. So what the point that I'm trying to make here is that we need to be very careful in these models because we are adding to the factors that might uh, cause overfitting in our models. Then there are several types of data biases that we should be careful about. One of the most commonly uh, occurring one is known as immortal time bias in survival studies. So if we have a patient enrolled in a study and we want to uh, determine the effect of a particular drug on a patient's survival. Now, Let's suppose that the patient, for example, in this figure, the patient was enrolled here and the prescription was filled after some amount of time and the event was observed after some some more time. So do we take whole of this time into consideration while uh, modeling survival or do we take only the time after the prescription filled? Now both of these options will have pros and cons. So we need to see, we need to study our data to determine which one would be a better option, which one would help us model the problem more real, in, in a more realistic fashion. OK, and this one is interesting. There might be a lot of confounding factors in your data. You need to be sure about what when, when you think that a factor might affect survival, you better need to be sure about you, you that it, it actually has an effect and it's just not some other spurious correlation. I'll give you an example. So you see here uh, it says my research shows ice cream is the mother of all evil, so ban it. And then you might ask, OK, why do you say so? I tell you I'm a data scientist and data has the evidence for it. You ask how, I tell you how. So here you can see a plot of forest fires and the sale of ice creams. So you can see that there is a high correlation among forest fires and the sale of ice cream. OK, but you say that here we ha already have wet and humid weather in the UK and we don't worry much about the forest fires. So I'll give you another reason to ban ice creams. And here it is. Now this is a plot of ice cream sales versus shark attacks, and you can see a major correlation here as well. You want some uh, some more evidence? I'll give you. So here, these are the polio rates and ice cream sales in the year 1949. 
So there you go. I have a factor and it shows high correlations with uh, some of the bad things in the society, some of the bad things in the environment. So, but perhaps if you think about it, maybe hot weather would be a better explanation for all of this. So we need to be, when we get such sorts of high correlations, we need to identify what actually is causing those correlations. Are there any confounding factors that might be the cause? And trust me, it happens more than uh, what we might expect. Uh, how much to, it, it, it happens more than we we want it to happen. So I'll wrap it up now and in short the whole of the message of this part of the presentation was know your data, know how it was collected, how were the patients enrolled, what data was collected. You should know you should have some domain knowledge. You should know about the possible confounding factors. Uh, you must know about the possible biases that your data might have know about your model as well. Are you modeling the right thing? Is the strategy correct? Is it even realistic to model this problem using this data? I mean, like uh, you, you may not want to model, you know, your Netflix recommendations based on the whole slide images because it does not make sense. Well, I think so. And you want to know what actually is the model learning. You either do it via interpretable modeling or come up with ways to find what the black box models are learning. Uh, I'll now, now uh, invite Rob to take over and he'll be talking about what is happening in the field currently uh, and how are the challenges that I just discussed? How are people trying to solve those? Over to you, Rob. Thank you. So while I um, just share my screen, if anyone has any questions um, for Amina in the meantime, please, please feel free to share. OK, if not, then can everyone see my screen OK? Mm, yes. OK, cool, thanks. So um, as I'm going to said, I'm going to talk a bit about um, how deep learning has been using computational pathology for survival analysis. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the how the kind of classical computational pathology challenges transfer over and the differences in approaches people have taken to solving them and some of the challenges with the sense of data and some alternative formulations for deep learning that people that people come up with, how those how predictions are taken up to whole slide level or even if you have multiple slides for a single patient and how those uh, come together to give you a final outcome prediction and briefly touch on some other topics and integration of genomic and other data, other data sources in what are called multimodal models. So one of the, the classic comp and challenges Amina talked about in computational pathology is how to analyze these whole, um, the whole side images for survival analysis. Now, unlike challenges like tumor segmentation, for example, as I'm going to mention, you can't just, a pathologist cannot annotate the regions that they know give a good prediction for survival analysis. So you, you have, there's three main methods people have come up with to address this. Most of them revolve around using some form of um, extracting patches based on regions of tumour, either annotated by a pathologist or um, an output from some tumour segmentation algorithm. And then when you have those annotations in those regions, what do you do with them? So this paper in the most, is an example of the most common where this is in the case of lung cancer, this example, you simply extract random, a certain number of random patches from tumour and just hope that they give you a strong signal in terms of survival outcome. Um, however, there are some more sophisticated ones recently. So this one is an example from mesothelioma, which is when there's a thin layer, it's thin layer of tissue that surrounds um, the majority of um, human organs and looking at um, survival analysis with cancer in, in, in that case. And they try, they train a network to try and identify which of the extracted tumor region patches are the most predictive in downstream tasks and then um, they rank them by which is the highest and lowest scoring in terms of final survival and you and only use a subset of those in order to predict um, the full survival at the end of their at the end of their pipeline and by doing this they found certain interesting um, phenomena such as they found the poor survival patches were mainly associated with 
high stromal regions and other features like that. So there's there's a decent amount of research going on in terms of how individual different tissue features um, integrate with uh, those sort um, those sorts of phenomena as well. And the third and the third and most recent approach people have tried is looking at um, clustering methods. So this is uh, another example with lung cancer data where the authors use a k-means clustering algorithm um, across the training data set and then trained a separate um, survival survival CNN model for each different cluster and then they then dropped which clusters had low um, predictive ability and there's other approaches as well that will cluster them by um, patient type by patients or by various other features and then select clusters in some using some metric or in some method and then aggregate those predictions together in order to get the final overall survival prediction and that some take a more global approach some take a more local approach but this is um, one of the main uh, the mo most recent approach um, that's been tried in the literature for this the other aspect to how people approach the challenge is i mean how you use tumor segment tissue segmentation so i talked briefly a little bit about how you people have used um, machine learning tissue segmentation and this is a, an example involving um, liver cancer where they only extract patches from the tumor versus not and ignore the non-tumor regions. But there are also um, some other approaches where, so this is a case from a paper where they had used a nine class um, tumor segmentation algorithm and extracted um, patches from all the different regions. And then if the predictability was over a certain threshold, um, use those features and performed a weighted sum in order to get the final um, Survival, survival prediction from that, which is much more sophisticated, but much more tricky um, way of predicting survival analysis with deep learning. But it's also all of these methods rely on the assumption that your tissue segmentation algorithm is accurate and also um, gives you a good ground, gives you a good approximation of the ground truth so that you can actually feedback and get some inference from what those the different patches are telling you in terms of your survival prediction. And the final part people have started to look at as well is how do you can you isolate certain tissue feet, um, certain tissue types and see how they affect um, survival analysis prediction. So this is taken from a paper where they were looking at um, uh, on prostate cancer and how they wanted to see how the influence of the stromal regions within uh, within cancerous regions uh, also in fact and the morphology of that and how it impacted survival analysis prediction so in a similar way to the tumor versus non-tumor um, segmentation approach i talked about earlier there's also starting to be some investigations into how different tissue types if you can isolate them how how that impacts it as well so that's kind of the main um, traditional challenge from computational pathology more of a deep learning focus um, challenge with survival analysis is to use deep learning inherently you need to have some loss function that is differentiable so you can perform the back propagation operation and use gradient descent, gradient descent as usual. So by, by its nature survival analysis data is neither a standard regression nor a classification problem. So you can't simply just perform a standard regression to survival time because then your censored cases you'll either have to consider them to be have an infinite survival time which is um, not representative of the underlying reality, or you have to say that their survival time is whatever the length of the study is from when they started. Again, this isn't necessarily representative of the, of the ground truth or the reality of what the situation actually is. But at the same time, you can't. You also can't turn it into a binary classification problem because then and say, did the patient survive or die at the, by the time the study was concluded? Because then you're also not making use of the time series element of the survival data as well. So this is um, one of the this is one of the main challenges and you need to find some use some loss function that takes into consideration both of these um, both of these problems. So there, there have been several different loss functions proposed. So the most common one is using the very similar adaptation from the Cox proportional hazard model, which uses the negative log partial likelihood of the survival data given the um, input image patches your data points and then there are two others um, that this 
this paper published um, only last year um, looked at and did a comparison of them. So I'll go through um, the first two in a little bit more detail, um, just to kind of explain the rationale and how they're adapted to this feature. So this is the, um, let me get the laser point. There we go. So this is the this is how they formulate the Cox um, loss function. So this they take the negative summation over this um, c is a binary variable where if it's censored it is equal to zero and if it's um, the alternative so the patient was deceased within the time period of equal to one. This um, x transpose um, beta is the um, network output, so the sum of all your the dot product of all your um, data data points with your weights, and then you take the negative log of the this this whole summation on this side here of the partial hazard and this, this is where you sum over all the patches j um j for which um the, a patient has a survival time greater than t sub i and this is how they adapt the um proportional hazard model to um survival analysis and make it to a differentiable loss function because you're trying to take the um partial likelihood of these of the um Survival time, which is what this term on the right represents here. And second one, briefly, just go through this as well. This is the UNO loss is based much more on the concordance index that one of the um, performance metrics Amina talked about earlier. And this uses this um, is, a, is a very similar formulation with the X transpose betas are the network outputs here, but they're for different um, pairs, which is why you have these sub i and sub j here. And this sigma is a parameter to define um, this, how smooth your approximation is because they use in this WI sub J, which I won't go through now because it's quite complex, um, it's quite complex and uses the um, Kaplan-Meier estimator and indicator functions at different time steps. This sigma is just a parameter to define how smooth the approximation you want to make, you want that to make. So you take the negative of this whole summation is what you turn into your loss function in this case. So using these, question, yeah. if I may, on the sure. previous, what is this WIJ? So these are just the weight um, weight parameters for I, for the different other different pairs. So I have a actually at the very end I think I have yeah. So this this is the whole complicated term of what this actually is. So these um, G these G's here are Kaplan Meier estimators at the times t here, and these I's are the indicated functions um, for given if an, an event had occurred or not, basically. So that's what this um, WI sub J represents. Okay. Does that answer your question? Or? Your way of telling what pairs to compare. Um, I think it's just computed for all possible pairs in, in terms of the way they do it, I think. Yeah. I'd have to go back it's, and double check that. But. So WIJ is computed for all possible pairs, but what? Yeah the loss would be penalized more heavily for certain pairs in comparison to other pairs based on how comparable they are, right? Yeah, exactly. OK, um, what was it? Yeah, and so using these different um, loss functions, they find that when you use these alternative loss functions, you get um, greater predictive, you get greater predictive form. So in this case, just looking at this, um, using the different the hazard ratios of different um, input variables, you get lower p-values when using the different um, loss functions here compared to um, some of the other ones as well. Um, and the final um, main challenge is very is how you, you take these survival predictions from individual patches and formulate them into a prediction for the entire slide. So in a, this is broadly very similar to how um, a lot of computational pathology MIL approaches work. So you can either treat the patches independently, or um, which is what this um, this paper does, looking at um, style analysis prediction in uh, gastric cancer, so a form of stomach cancer, and use operations such as um, they just use majority voting from all the patches they extract from tumor regions. But there are also other attempts to use very similar variations to things like attention, multiple instances learning, and as well as um, recurrent neural networks to um, bring all these predictions together. Just very briefly before I hand over, just to touch on um, a couple of other more recent approaches that people have looked at. So graph um, convolutional networks have 
um, been started be, to be used for survival analysis as well. So very similar to many computational pathology um, papers where you use a CNN or some other feature extractor to formulate your graph in some way and then use graph com convolution operations and other features in order to get your output prediction. And there's other ways that also combine these with um, normal C CNN features and also multimodal data. And in particular, multimodal data, this is one that's starting to get much more attention around it. So this is how much does this is trying to ask the question is um, whole, is histopathology or whole slide data um, helpful or a hindrance to predicting survival outcome compared to just using um, cl clinical or genomic genomic data? So there are conflicting results on this. So some pa some papers have found that um, if you include histopathology data, it doesn't improve a model over one that uses clinical features only, which is what this paper finds. But there are also others that find the if you include histopathology data then you are <clears throat> excuse me you are, um you do get improved performance so it seems that um the consensus is now that histo histology based features can boost a survival model's performance however also by adding all of these different features and and together you are having a huge amount of features compared to the amount of data points you will have for any given patient or for any given example so one of my criticisms with of potentially the multimodal approaches would be that that there's you're incorporating a huge number of features that may or may not be conducive so that to getting good results so there's a huge potential for overfitting with some of these approaches but they are starting to get some good results so just to summarize briefly overall there's no main consensus in terms of how to best um, find regions for survival analysis and or even how to approach capturing different um, tumor morphology regions for downstream analysis. But there's lots of different approaches currently being tried. There, there are different approaches to adapting fundamental engineering of deep learning, such as loss functions, to accommodate for the right sensor nature of the data you get in survival analysis. And they've, they've been shown to outperform binary classification loss functions. So if you treat problem more as a survival analysis problem, that's been shown to improve performance. And the main current areas of research now are incorporating multimodal pan cancer and interpretable um, interpretable models are the main areas of research people are looking at, at the moment. So that's all from my side. So thank you. And I'm going to hand over to Noah now, who's going to talk about some of the methods more in depth. So over to you. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay, we'll start with the overall taxonomy of the different survival approaches. So we'll quickly go over these because some of them have already been discussed in the previous Patari sessions. So we mainly have the statistical methods and the uh, machine learning methods as some of them the Rob, uh, Rob already discussed. Uh, so we have in the statistical methods we have parametric, semi-parametric and um, non-parametric and these are some of the uh, methods in each of these categories. So Kaplan math, and Nelson Allen and life tables and then the Cox uh, different variations comes under the semi-parametric and in the machine learning methods we usually see survival trees using different variations the neural networks and of course support vector machine and deep learning. So uh, the statistical methods versus the machine learning approaches, we see these statistical methods usually can deal uh, only with low dimensional data and they can more focus on the distribution of the event times and uh, how to estimate those parameters and their statistical properties. Uh, on the other hand, the machine learning um, methods, uh, they can deal with high dimensional data 
and they can combine the traditional survival methods with other machine learning techniques uh, and can deal with uh, overfitting problems as well. This is a summary of uh, the uh, parametric, semi-parametric and non-parametric methods uh, uh, where the assumptions for some of them are listed here, like the non-parametric uh, doesn't assume any distribution for the data, whereas the parametric assume a distribution and the semi-parametric, uh, some of these methods can even deal with uh, correlation and can find out useful features from the data. Uh, for the machine learning, uh, this is again a summary of uh, different methods. Uh, for example, as discussed in the previous slides, the neural networks uh, to do an end-to-end -end survival, you can put the Cox model on top of your neural network model and also these random survival forest we mm -hmm. can use uh, averaging the prediction from multiple trees and different boosting methods as well and now one of the challenges discussed was the high dimensional data in terms of the statistical methods uh, one way is to put a constraint on the coefficient so we call this penalized regression and this works um, better for um, selection of different uh, uh, features as well as uh, the estimation of the coefficients and if you have a high dimensional data these methods will work better in those situations here's an example study which uh, use this um, metric sensor regression uh, with regularization and compared their uh, method to simple cox based uh, analysis and other uh, regularization like lasso or elastic net and in terms of the see in this is you can see and they show performance uh, gain over the other methods and these were actually uh, used on um, high dimensional gene expression data sets and now uh, some of the methods in literature, they try to extract um, features from images uh, and using those handcrafted features for survival analysis. So one of this study, uh, which was related to the recurrence uh, of risk of DCIS recurrence. And uh, we know if, if the uh, DCIS uh, is uh, removed which we call this mastectomy this will reduce the chances but it might um, uh, over treat or under treat the patient so in this study they took 344 mastectomy uh, treated patient where not all of the affected area is removed but some of the area is removed then this means there would be some chances of recurrence so that's why they try to predict the risk of the DCS recurrence here. This is the overall uh, pipeline where they take the whole slide image and sliding window based segmentation uh, from these tiles and they extract some uh, handcrafted features, mostly texture based features and use those features initially uh, with random forest to uh, do segmentation, region segmentation on the whole slide image. And once uh, they do this uh, region uh, segmentation, they then extract different features from these different regions and use them uh, uh, to, to come up with the best set of features that are discriminative. So in this case, they selected only eight features which were fed into random uh, forest to classify the patient to low and high risk. Uh, this um, table B shows what features they have used. Uh, and in the sub figure D, we see the, the hazard ratios associated with those different features. And a figure C shows the um, separation of the patients the high risk, which means the um, the patient had this distance metastasis record in them uh, and versus the low risk. And they, they show a, a good separation in this with uh, a very small p-value. 
they compare the um, image based features uh, method with other clinical features and show their method uh, is significant with a high hazard ratio. Similarly, uh, people have used uh, deep features which come from uh, deep CNNs uh, for prediction of uh, survival. So to predict the uh, disease uh, specific survival, um, this method uh, used directly the whole side image based sorry TMA based patches without doing any uh, tissue segmentation or classification as an in intermediate step. So this data set was uh, related to colorectal cancer and the outcome data and the clinical pathological data was available. They used a VGG 16 to extract features from image tiles and those features were then fed into LSTM tile by tile to predict five years disease specific survival. <coughs> this two are all uh, framework. So they take this tile and so they take um, the whole slide image divided into multiple tiles and for each tile uh, they extract uh, CNM based features, which are then used with multiple classifiers like SVM and logistic regression or naive based classifier uh, to compare its their performance with their method, which is based on this recurrent network uh, and uh, predicting the patient either into a high risk and low risk. In terms of uh, survival comparison, they also uh, collected um, the visual risk, which were assigned by pathology, three pathologists uh, by observing the whole slide TMA, sorry, the TMA, and they compared their method uh, with the visual score as well. These are the separation curves for the different methods. So the first one is based on their method, which they called digital risk score. Again, um, good separation is shown here for the disease uh, specific survival in terms of Kaplan markers with a significant p, p value in comparison to the visual risk which was assigned by pathologists. Uh, the curves are not as uh, separable uh, as compared to their method and similarly they also compared with these uh, histological grade based separation of the patient into two groups. In terms of the predictive performance of the different classifiers and in also in terms of hazard ratio, they showed their method uh, achieves higher AUC as compared to the other methods. They also did experiment uh, on uh, different resolution of the pages. So a high resolution of 0.22 micrometer and then they use a medium resolution with uh, down something of four fact, factor four and similarly uh, another low resolution. So they, they show the high resolution performing better than the other resolutions. Now this another study which is related to prostate cancer prognostics recurrence in African-American patients. Uh, they use uh, deep learning ma uh, based methods which were previously trained for region segmentations and then uh, there are some features um, based on these uh, deep features. So those handcrafted features were then used for survival analysis. The data set included 334 uh, prostate cancer patient. They went this um, surgery. Those WSI were uh, normalized, sorry, annotated by pathologists for tumor region so that they can extract uh, those uh, handcrafted features out of them. So the deep uh, models they used, they were previously trained for, uh, for classifying different cells and uh, 
doing region segmentation for the stroma regions. So once they use those models, they calculated uh, these handcrafted features, uh, which include the stromal structure and global and local connectivity graph of those stromal nuclei and some other features based on these. <coughs> This tumoral flow where the pathologist annotated some tumor region and they use those regions uh, to do the stromal region detection and the stromal cells detection. So the cells were then used to form different cluster based features and the stromal region for region based features. And using those different features, handcrafted features, they fed them to random forest and also compared with uh, elastic net Cox model to stratify the patient to high and low risk. In terms of uh, Kaplan markers, <coughs> when they use the uh, elastic net Cox model, this the separation uh, with hazard ratio 4.7 and significant p value 0 0.002. And this is a, another fold of the data. On the bottom, the subfigure, this is for the ML-based approach, which is the random forest. In this, in this case, it seems the a Cox proportional hazard model performs better than um, the ML-based approach in terms of the p-value and even visually you can see the separation of the curves. Now, uh, other than those uh, handcrafted and the features, people have tried to combine uh, uh, different modalities as well. So this study, which was related to the survival prediction of uh, multimodality data, uh, they are uh, what they try to maximize the correlation uh, among the two modality. The one was the image based uh, and the second was the gene expression. The data set they used uh, was from TCGA with uh, lung cancer patients as well as brain tumor patients. And the overall survival data and pathological images and molecular data were available for these. They used uh, uh, around 1000 by 1000 pixel pages for the automated, from the automated uh, tumor regions, annotated tumor regions, and used those for the um, end to end model, um, model training to compare their method with other um, models. Uh, they use uh, some handcrafted features from those uh, annotated tumor areas uh, based on cell profiler. This is the pipeline they used. So this uh, branch, uh, this uh, layer show the, the, the F1, it shows the CNN based uh, feature extraction directly from the pathological images. And the second branch here, F2, shows the molecular data coming into, so they combine this to the fully connected layer. And once uh, they combine these two features, they put a correlation layer here, which is then connected to this loss, survival loss function in an end-to-end -end training of these two uh, branches. In terms of comparison, they use C index to compare it with other methods. So the statistical methods on top, which use those handcrafted features from the images and fed into different models. And they did also experiment only using the gene expression with those uh, different models. And lastly, they integrated the image based features with the uh, gene expression model to see how the combination works. So the last row here, deep correlation survival um, model is their model. And in term of C index, it performs better than the other uh, simple 
methods as well as the combination of uh, different uh, methods. So here we see deep correlation was trained separately and the features were then used by deep survival network to do the prediction. So this combination was not even better than their um, deep correlation which was training the model uh, both the branches uh, uh, together. Now the, the other challenge that was discussed, the intratumoral heterogeneity that is present in the whole slide images. So we can see that this biopsy have um, a range of histological patterns uh, that can uh, represent different disease prognosis. And these subtle changes in those histological features are very difficult even for experienced pathologists um, to recognize or to interpret them. So this one tried to integrate this histopathology image with genomic um, data again and to address this uh, heterogeneity. They did some sampling test method and also um, a risk filtering technique to, to overcome those challenges. This is the data set they used, which comprises of the lower grade gliomas in this grade four uh, patient with uh, the survival ranging from one to 14 years or even more. The overall pipeline is this, the <coughs> I think they, they did some annotation of uh, a region of interest using and uh, this uh, framework which is web based and once they get this high power field they it were fed to the cnn which was fitted with this uh, cox model on top and back propagated this uh, negative log likelihood so this is the one uh, way where only the cnn is shown here and the way they trained this was the this region of interest. They took these samples, uh, high power field from the region of interest, and they trained the, the CNN model in end to end way. Uh, when they were testing it, so again they randomly selected some region of interest in the tumor area, and based on each region they subdivided it into multiple uh, fields and predicted risk for each of those uh, sub -tile, you can say and for each region they took the median risk and finally for each of those uh, nine regions they ranked the the risk the patient in terms of their risk score Took the took the second um, risk score as the final prediction, uh, and they mentioned that this was done because on the to to do some uh, uh, to avoid some artifact that may be present in the images. When they uh, <coughs> compared the their method, which is this SCNN, uh, in terms of uh, concordance index with the clinical grade or the genomic data or the combination of the um, histology plus genomic. Uh, it shows that the, the C index is higher uh, for this histology plus genomic than the SCCNN method, which only uses the, the image based features with CNN. Then they combine this. So integration of the CNN based features uh, with the genomic data when trained uh, end to end uh, combinedly, they show that their uh, method, which now they call genomic survival convolution network, their C index increase uh, as compared to the other methods. They also show some visualization, the for example, in this case, the microvascular proliferation region was predicted as high risk, which is a high risk region here. 
and some of the other region like the normal cortex was predicted as low risk so so this is a, a very developing trend and that the pathologists or the clinician want to see some explainable features and the, the the researchers are trying to 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 explain or to get or to come up with some explainable features which can then help the pathologist why why this is a high risk and why this is a low risk so this this kind of trend going into this feature i think that's all from my side i will hand over to fayaz you can discuss the uh, what uh, what to do and what not to do when doing those experiments. Hey, can you hear me and can you see my screen, everyone? I can see the screen, yeah. Okay. And I can hear you. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Noor. Uh, I'll be talking about, so as, as Noor and Rob have presented, there are a number of methods in computational pathology that are now being used to predict survival. And I'm going to try to discuss what are the major issues in performance evaluation of those methods or in general in terms of uh, uh, survival analysis. So the title of the presentation that I would be giving is essentially how to fool the masses when reporting survival prediction results. But before we get to that, let's take a step back. If you look at in, in the literature right now, you will be able to find a number of methods for computational pathology and in other domains for survival analysis. And the goal of developing survival analysis methods or survival prediction methods in computational pathology is actually not to be able to predict survival, but rather to identify novel features that can then be used in the clinic for risk stratification or therapeutic decision making. So it's a survival prediction is a means to an end and, the, and that end is we need to identify are there any patterns that we can see that are correlated with high or low survival or that, let's say with the recurrence of a certain disease. And while I was researching this, this uh, whole area, what really struck me or what amazed me is Pathologists, even without the use of computers, have been able to come up with uh, approaches that are uh, or, or with prognostic indices that can predict survival quite correctly by through through manual measurement of tumor size or uh, similar things. For example, the novel prognostic index, uh, the Nottingham prognostic index, is a very good example of that, in which pathologists analyze the size of the index uh, of of the tumor the whether there are any nodes that are uh, lymph nodes that are uh, that have been invaded and what is the grade of that tumor and together they made a very simple formula that then allows you to predict the the, the risk uh, for a given patient and you can actually assign that if you have a uh, if a patient has a nottingham prognostic index of let's say greater than 5.4 then the chance, five year survival chances are 50 percent and so on and, and the purpose of giving this is in, uh, as an example is that this is what pathologists actually want. Now, what we are delivering to them in the field are, hey, look at this, I use deep learning to predict survival. That's good. Uh, that really shows that we have uh, developed predictors that are able to generate predictions, but uh, it's, it's, that is not the end. And what I was looking for uh, while I was researching on this is and I haven't been able to find anything is a method, a deep learning method, a machine learning method, anything like that, that has analyzed images, a whole lot of them, and found a single feature that is now in clinical use for either risk stratification or therapeutic decision making. And I haven't come across any. If there is someone else is aware of any, I'll uh, be gladly like to be educated in that. But I haven't found anything that has that, that that computer scientists or computational pathologists have discovered to help the help advance that part. We have a number of predictors, and that's it right now, at least in, at least to the best of my knowledge. We want to go beyond that, so that means for all the PhD students, the postdocs, and all, all the other researchers out there as well, this is an open arena. Find me a feature that can get clinical or therapeutic translation 
using uh, machine learning, image analysis, deep learning, doesn't matter what you use. Given that, also keep in mind that pathologists, even without the use of computers, have done quite well. They have found these prognostic indices, not only for uh, breast cancer, but for other uh, types of cancer as well. Again, and now with the use of computers, we should ideally be able to do better. Okay, so that's the that's the goal of survival analysis in general. And one of the reasons that I've been able to find is in the in the in the research why this hasn't taken place is performance assessment. We identify a feature that we think is correlative with survival. We don't really do a stress analysis of whether that is a true prediction or not. And we can publish a paper and then the project is over. I think we need to do better than that. So let's talk about how you can actually, or what you should be paying attention to when you're reporting results for uh, survival analysis in computational pathology. So there, there, are, there are a number of points. I briefly showed them in our last presentation in, my, on, on, in the Patari session. So this is how you can actually fool the masses when reporting survival prediction results. Uh, the font is too small, but there are a bunch of ways in which you can actually get away with showing a feature that or showing your predictor actually uh, showing your predictor works where in reality it doesn't. So when you are reviewing a paper on survival prediction, these are some of the things that you may want to keep in mind. Okay, and I, what I'll try to do is to go through major ones of these. I put them in the notes, which are of course available as a recording and as part of this Batari session as well. So you can go through these in detail later on. The first or the biggest problem that I've seen in the field is that most computational pathology papers when they are doing uh, survival analysis, produce a single p-value on a single test split. Some people, uh, some papers, recent papers, as Noor uh, showed, do actually analyze uh, the variation in the C-index over multiple runs, which is the way it should be done. So, but most of the papers, what they do is they do a single data split or train and test or what they call discovery and validation. So discovery is the training part and validation is the other part. The FETA model using the training bit, pass in the training data, get survival scores, put a log rank test, calculate the C index. If that P value is less than 0.05, they puff out their chest and say we're proud and, and we, have a, we have a significant result. Our method is able to now predict survival. However, this is this may not be this may not be the case. Okay. So this there is significant variation in p values on the same data set. So if I change the data split a little bit, a feature that was previously shown to be significant on a different split may no, may no longer be significant. OK, so that is one of the biggest problems in this. So what I did is I did some initial experiments on a, on a survival prediction data set in which I analyzed what is the p value of the same predictor when I change the amount of training and test data and how does that impact p values and how does that impact c indices so what i did is i ran this experiment a thousand times i divided the data set into uh, in a 50 50 split 50 percent of the data was used for training and 50 percent of the data was used for testing and then i repeated this experiment multiple times about a thousand times over here and this is the histogram of the p values for that particular predictor as you can see, you get different p, we get different p values whenever you run this experiment. Sometimes your p values can be very large, 0.8, but most of the time for this particular predictor, they were quite small. Notice that the y axis is logarithmic, so most of the time this value is actually so. So we actually get p values less than 0.05, which is indicated by this uh, orange line over here. But in some cases, you actually do get p values larger than that. So if you are unlucky and you use only one operating point, you might say that this particular predictor is useless, when in reality it is actually useful because most of the time it does produce a p-value that is quite small. But once you do this analysis, once you do multiple data splits, uh, you how do we combine these p-values? Because each experiment you do actually produces a single result, and how do we combine these bootstrap estimates or these cross-validation estimates? So that is the major question here. There are some really good recent papers that actually talk about this problem. And the most effective solution and a conservative solution that I have found is simply to take the median of the p-values of all of these runs and multiply that with two. Don't ask me for the reasons for it right now, but 
it gives you a very good statistical estimate of the overall p-value. So for the distribution of p-values that you see on the screen, in the screen on the right at the bottom, the green line is actually the twice the median of the of the p-value. And as you can see, it is less than 0.05, which is indicated by this orange line. Hence, in, I can say that this feature or this predictor is now probably, uh, I'm more confident to say that this is a, uh, uh, can stratify patients and do survival analysis. So whenever you want to predict survival, do multiple runs, multiple data splits of that. Okay, and you can use, uh, you can calculate a single p-value by combining them using the median approach that I just talked about. The references uh, are over here. Mustafa has asked during your cross validation experiments with uh, various data sets, did you consider a reasonable distribution of data from various groups? In the training testing set, yes, it is stratified with respect to the censoring, uh, and I'm going to talk about that in just a sec. So the goal is, is this feature set significant or not, as I, as I said earlier? OK, so you do your runs. You take a feature set one, let's say, and you train a predictor. In this case, I had about 319 samples, and we did bootstrap runs. I calculated the C index at after each run, after each train test bit, and also calculated the p-value. Now, as you can see, the p-value is significant. The median of the p-value is actually smaller than the threshold of 0.05 that we had, and the average C index is close to 0.7. Okay, so that's a good thing. If I use another feature set, let's say feature set two, which is a different set of features without going into the detail, I can see that this, these features, although sometimes they do produce p-values that are less than 0.05, the median is greater than 0.05, hence, I'm not confident that this feature set is actually discriminative or can stratify patients based on their risk of, or, or based on their survival. Similarly, the C index score is around 0.62 or 0.63. So that's another point. So when you have, whenever you want to analyze whether this feature set gives me any useful information or whether this feature set gives me any useful information, do multiple runs. So that's the major lesson here. The next bit is, Ignore the differences. So if you ignore the differences of survival probabilities across training and validation sets, if you have a training set that has a different distribution of survival times and, and event times in comparison to your uh, validation or training set, or, or there are significant differences between training and validation, you might up, end up with a predictor that underperforms. Although your predictor is better, but the reported numbers are going to be lower. So we saw an example of that in one of our ongoing pro projects in which we analyzed what is the difference between the survival curve of just the training data and the validation data. Ideally, they should look like this. There shouldn't be any difference between the survival probabilities of the training set and the validation set. If there are, there must be a reason for that, and that reason is worth investigating before you commit to doing survival analysis or developing predictors for that. So whenever you are given a data set, you're given a training set and a validation set, make sure that the survival probabilities of those actually are the same and they have the same survival curves in both the training and test sets. And you can verify that by running a simple log rank test based on the division of whether an example is in the training set or not, and you should get p-values greater than 0.05, indicating that there is no statistically significant difference between your training and test set, okay? The other point is whenever you have you are given us a, a survival analysis task, it is important that you stratify your data sets in terms of uh, censoring. So just like whenever you when you solve a classification problem, you uh, are, and you are asked to evaluate the performance of that, you make sure that the proportion of examples in the train and test splits are uh, for different classes are the same. In the same way, when you do survival analysis, it is important that you stratify your events in your train and test set so that the proportion of events in training and test is roughly the same. Otherwise, your numbers may either be most likely be underestimates. For example, your C index may be an underestimate of the actual performance of your predictor. So if you want a good predictor, this, these things can actually help you get better numbers as well. So be careful in analyzing the, the distribution of training and test sets, as well as 
when you have uh, as well as of the event time. So this is very important. Very few people mention it in their papers. I'm, I deliberately am not mentioning any papers that don't do this, but there are a number of papers that do not pay any attention to this yeah, in the literature. The next problem I've seen in the literature is throwing what I call throwing the kitchen sink of features at the problem. So let's say I try a feature number one or a set of features and those don't show significance. Then what I do is I go ahead and try another bunch of features until I find a feature or set of features that are significant that give me a p-value of 0.05. This is what I mean by throwing the kitchen sink of features at the problem. It is important to remember that every feature that you try in your machine learning approach for survival analysis is a single hypothesis. Let's say it is this geometry of tissues uh, or tumor and stroma that is predictive of survival. Now that is your hypothesis. You can end up with a thousand hypotheses, but only a small fraction of those are actually going to be true positives. And it is highly likely that if you try a bunch of randomly or independent features, you may end up with a feature that actually is not predictive of survival, but does give you a p-value less than 0.05. So this is what is called a false discovery. And there are corrections available, uh, statistical corrections available. Whenever you want to try multiple features, you can either use the Benjamini, Hochberg, or Bonferroni, Bonferroni correction for that purpose. The example I like to give for, for that is that even if a person is a lousy bowling player, sometimes the even if they throw their ball at random, it is going to knock a number of uh, knock down a number of pins. So just because a feature is showing significance doesn't mean it is actually significant unless you have uh, corrected for multiple hypothesis testing and you have a large enough data set for validation. So it's important to to make sure that we don't fall into this p hacking uh, strategy. Another thing, yes, uh, Nasir has a question. So just um, on that point, um, I, I I appreciate that it's really important that um, you know you you don't um, have random features that by you know ju just some fluke, pure fluke, they show statistical significance. But at the same time, if we have demonstrated the significance of those features, even if I've tried 10,000 features and I found only one to be significant on my discovery cohort, but I show that it, the same feature works on a completely independent validation cohort, um, would that not be good enough? That would be good enough, given that, for example, if I have a limited data set, which you typically do, so let's say if I've got uh, 100 or let's say even 1000 uh, test subjects. OK, so that is the size of our test uh, test set. And I use a alpha threshold or uh, the p value threshold of 0.05, right? And I get a p value, let's say 0.005. Mm -hmm. But I've tried, let's say. About 100 features. Let, let's push it all the way. Let's say 10,000 features. No, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to fall apart at, at this place as well, so it doesn't, yeah. doesn't really matter. If those features are independent, then if I apply the Bonferroni correction, then what that means is that I'll be multiplying this p-value that I got of 0 0.05 with 100. Then the adjusted p-value is going to be 0 0.5, which is no longer significant. But, but again, my, my question is... Yeah, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. What this shows is that this is probably not significant, but it is worth investigating because it did show significance without the correction. The next step you do is you do a power analysis on this. What that means is you find out what is the number of samples you need in an independent test set that would be required to show that this feature is in, feature is in, 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 uh, indeed significant. And in our first Patari, we actually talked about how you can do that power analysis. So what the power analysis is going to do is going to give you a number of samples that you need to have in an independent test set in order to show st statistical significance of this particular feature. Now, so, so, at, so you do power analysis on that and outcomes, let's say, tells you that you need, let's say, 10,000 cases just to validate that this is significant. 
If you use that, then your statistical significance is established. Otherwise, we cannot say that it is true. OK, so, so although, think, although, sure. yeah, so as long as if your test set is sufficiently large, if your independent test set is sufficiently large, then that gives me more confidence. OK, so to take your bowling analogy. Let's say that we have, you know, 100 people who are trying to throw the ball. Mm -hmm. right? One of them actually happens to be really good at it. Yeah. Um, do we have to do that multiplication with 100? If they are independent of each other, mm -hmm. like so, so here it's, it's a different example that you gave. So once you have like uh, 100 different people, that is 100 different feature sets that you are analyzing. And you are, you're saying is that one of them is actually better than uh, everyone else. Then how many games do you need to actually establish that that particular person is better? than everyone else. This is what power analysis allows you to do. So if your data set is small, for example, if I my, my original data set was of 1000 test examples and then you have another independent set that had only 100 samples in it and it shows significance in it, it's good that now you have additional support, but it still wouldn't be called statistical significant support unless you have a very large number of samples as predicted by your power analysis. So that's the that's the difficulty there. But because we only have a small amount of data, that would probably be the. At least we should do that what you suggested. It's better than not having any analysis. Than to have an independent analysis. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I, I. I understand. I think somebody's asked exactly the same question in a slightly different way, Deng, um, that if we demonstrate the significance of a feature, even if I have tried 10,000 features, but one of them is really good at predicting survival, you know, disease free, disease specific, whatever mm -hmm. um, on discovery as well as completely independent validation cohort. Why do I have to multiply with 10,000? So, so, so you don't need to multiply the test statistic of the independent set. What I'm saying is that the data that you use to make this in this discovery, you would need to multiply it in order to show that your feature are statistically significant because you have done multiple hypothesis testing. So what? So a p-value of 0 0.05 actually means is that five out of 100 hypotheses that you test are actually going to be false positive or they are going to give you at least as extreme values as, as you have observed. If your data set is really large and a feature is significant, then the expected p value is going to be really, 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 really small. And even if you multiply it with a very large number, it's still going to be less than 0 0.05. So that's why it's, it's important to make such, ad, such adjustments, especially if you're trying to do a large number of features so that you, the discovery you make is actually significant. And if, if the features are not completely independent, um... then you can do Benjamin Hochberg. So this okay. the, the method that I talked about is Bonferroni correction. This is an oversimplified method, but it's easier to explain in a, in a short time. So this is the, this is this other approach that you can use. So this multiple hypothesis testing. If, if you want a feature that actually makes into makes it into clinical use or therapeutic use, we actually want really low p values really really low p values on the on the data set that we are using as well as if you can demonstrate it on an independent data set even better otherwise it's important you do these adjustments do a power analysis and then uh, proceed from there i hope that answers uh, this okay um I, I think in the interest of time we'll just uh, skip mm -hmm. Uh, but thank you. OK, uh, so so in, in terms of the bowling analogy again, uh, it this would allow you to determine if person A is better than person B, how many tournaments does it take to prove that? That's the that's the analog there. Anyways, let's move on. Uh, so there are confounders and colliders when you have multiple features. So for example, if you have a data set that is given to you for survival analysis, 
and you have people that have been given a treatment and that have not been given a treatment and you those are in the same group and you're trying to predict a survival without paying any attention to this treatment versus no treatment category you might end up with a predictor that predicts which people are treated and which people are not treated rather than predicting their survival so it is important that you ensure that the groups that you divide uh, or stratify are actually comparable similarly people with if you have uh, in your group people that are really old and get sick and die and people who are young and don't get sick then your predictor is essentially not predicting any impact of the disease but just of age so it is important to take into account those variables as well the same thing goes for comorbidities is it because of the pattern i see in the tissue is that due to the cancer or is it because of any other for example is it due to smoking or something else so it is important to analyze other diseases that might be affecting uh, your your outcome variable together with the outcome variable so so breast cancer specific survival means uh, analyzing the the survival of a patient only with respect to breast cancer without any other comorbidities so if you are trying to analyze it uh, predict survival it is important to show make sure that your data doesn't have any other comorbidities in it ideally speaking in terms of the overall uh, analysis this is a diagram that i pulled off uh, judea pearl's book on causal inference most of the work that we have seen in survival analysis in computational pathology is based on what he calls rung one ladder of causal inference and that is learning associations in which we are simply analyze is it this pattern that is correlated with survival or not the second rung that i haven't seen many people talk about is intervention how would the survival of this patient change if i gave them a certain treatment so there are there are beginning to be some methods there and then there are the, the third rung is counterfactuals had this patient not been given treatment what would be their survival and when you are moving up from this rung one or associative ladder on to this intervention and counterfactual ladders of causal inference especially in survival analysis you need to be cognizant of confounders and collider biases uh, we don't have the time to go into detail but this is a whole other area that is uh, laying out in front of us so the last uh, in the last few minutes i'm going to talk about c indices which are widely used so i'll begin with a question if a classifier is random what is the auc or oc you expect from that classifier anyone so i'm not talking about survival models if you have a prediction problem a survival uh, a classification problem and your classifier is completely random what is the auc or oc you're going to get come on guys 0.5 yes 0.5 if a survival analysis model is completely useless at ranking what patients would survive longer and what patients would would not what do you expect the c index of that predictor to be a completely useless predictor 0.5 again yeah that's the expectation except that it's not true this is not the case it depends upon the number of censored cases in your data set to verify that i did a simple experiment so i'm going to put a couple of questions again what do you expect would happen to p values and c indices on survival times of scores of a trained survival predictor prediction model if i shuffle the events in the test set so for example if i have these test set given to me and i shuffle their events so you see only the event variable is changed so i make the data completely random what is going to happen what is what what is the C index you are going to get. Anyone? So I, I I use a predictor that is perfect, let's say, but I shuffle the event times, so uh, the event variable. So people who had have had an event may no longer have an event listed next to them. Well, if you do this experiment in practice, and I did that, what you get is a C index close to 0.5, but not exactly 0.5. You get a C index of 0.72 originally, but if I shuffle it, shuffle the event variable, which corresponds to having a classifier that is completely, or a survival prediction model that is completely useless, you end up with a, 
a C index that is 0.55. It's close to 0.5, but it's not exactly 0.55. This is not your uh, baseline because of the next question I'm going to ask. So remember, we have features, we have events, and we have times. If I shuffle the time, not the event, so I shuffle the time of the of the at which these patients experienced an event while keeping the event the same. So notice there is no change in the event, but only shuffle the time. What we would expect is, as Mustafa said as well, because this data is now completely randomized with respect to their event times. So the predictor that I'm going to try is should give me a C index of close to 0.5, but it doesn't. It actually gives you a C index of 0.68, which is pretty high in comparison to the baseline when we don't have any shuffling. So what this means is that this is your baseline now. It's not 0.5, it's 0.68. So this is what a completely useless model would be able to give when it ranks machine, uh, when, when it ranks survival uh, or, or cases that, that are given to it as input. So in this case, the baseline of the C index is 0.68 as a predictor that will be completely useless at sorting or ranking patients based on their survival times will give 0.68. So this is the lowest baseline and your machine learning model should at least do better than 0.68. If your machine learning model gives you 0.65, it's better than 0.5 and that you may want to put it in the paper that you have, you got good results, but that would be incorrect. And I've seen people do that in, in, in the literature, okay? Moving on, so the baseline is 0.5. There are other assumptions there as well uh, that on C index, but I'm not going to go into detail. The most important thing that I've also found is that what people do in computational pathology is they know that a certain feature is imp important. For example, uh, let's say the, the occurrence of lymphocytes within the tumor. We know that it is statistically significant. It, it is able to rank. Pathologists have already analyzed it and told us but what we do is we calculate it using image-based image, image -based techniques and then we put a twist on it. So let's say a feature X is significant and then let's say we put a complex machine learning model and feed that feature as input and then we say that our model is statistically significant. No, that's not the case. We haven't discovered a new feature that may be clinically use, useful. What we have done is use an existing feature so it's essentially not adding to the to the to the bigger picture here. There is also the case of conditional uselessness. If you have a feature that is significant and you have another feature that is uh, also significant, you give that to a model. You don't need both of these features in the model. Only one of those should do because given that you know one of them, the other becomes useless. So that's the other issue that I've seen people dwell over. There are also some approaches, uh, some libraries that use a different implementation of C index calculations. So Pi Survival and Lifelines, they have slightly different implementations of C index, and you may end up getting different results if you use the C index calculation method for these two, from these two different libraries because, the way, because of the way they handle tied event times. So some of times Lifelines gives you better results, some of the time Pi Survival gives you better results. So don't be depressed if your C index is low in comparison to another paper. Just make sure that you understand how they calculated the C index. And also, uh, if you want to fool the masses, forget assumptions in that that you uh, that you or your predictor or other people's predictors make or their limitations. Also, don't pay attention to feature interpret interpretability. This is a quote from a paper that claims that they have discovered a feature or an image-based feature that is predictive of survival. So it says that number of pixels in between the first and second or two threshold within a certain region in the image. This is not informative to a pathologist. It may, be, uh, it, it may have an interpretation, but it is important for us to get to that interpretation. And we also want to work on developing prognostic formulas and indices. So there's still quite a lot of work to be done if we are to see a computational pathology derived feature making its way into clinical practice. So that is the playground we, we guys are up against and I think there's still a lot to be done. I would just conclude here. I uh, have already gone a bit over time. 
I apologize for that and thank you for staying uh, with us. I would uh, thank all of uh, the awesome contributors for all of their discussion. And since we started the Patari with a quote by a Roman, uh, with the story of a Roman general, we'll end at one as well. If there are any questions, uh, please feel free to go ahead. And I would like to thank all of the uh, all of the awesome people who worked with me as volunteers in this series in this series on Patari sessions. I hope it would have been it would be useful for everyone in the group.